just shows the importance of City Club. I've been a member for three years.
most of our end. Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Lisa Watson, President of City Club. For more than 100 years, the City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and explore. We're gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel and welcome all of you joining us via KGW's website, Facebook feed or news app, X-Ray FM, or on Open Signal's community media television stations. The generous support of City Club's media partners and corporate sponsors enable us to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to recognize City Club's winter sponsor, Portland General Electric. Please show our appreciation to everyone who's made today's event possible. Today, our panel will debate whether Oregonians should approve temporary assessments on insurance companies, some hospitals, and other providers of insurance or healthcare coverage to fund healthcare for low-income individuals and families and to stabilize health insurance premiums. Moderating the debate is Jeff Mapes, senior political reporter at Oregon Public Broadcasting. Mr. Mapes has spent 32 years at the Oregonian and has covered numerous presidential, congressional, gubernatorial, and ballot measure campaigns as well as many legislature ses legislative sessions stretching back to 1985. Mr. Mapes will introduce our panelists. Please join me in welcoming them all. Well, thanks so much for inviting me to this important discussion. As our president once so famously said, healthcare is complicated. So, so let me try to quickly provide a common frame of reference before we engage our panelists. Uh, Measure 101 is a referendum on some sections of a bill passed by the Oregon legislature last year to help provide the state match to Medicaid, the federal state program that was greatly expanded under the Affordable Care Act, commonly known as Obamacare, and now covers more than a million Oregonians. The referendum asks voters to decide on two taxes. One is a 1.5% tax on several kinds of health insurers. The other belts on some existing levies on hospitals to add a 0.7% tax on larger hospitals. The official estimate is that these taxes would raise between $210 million and $320 million in the next two years. This state money will generate uh, three times as much in federal matching money according to that official estimate. A quick word on how the referendum works. Sponsors gained enough signatures to refer the issue to the ballot. Voters will in essence now act in place of the legislature. A yes vote approves those taxes, a no vote rejects the taxes in question. All clear? Okay, hope I haven't already lost you. Uh, I'm also going to plead with our panelists to be as clear as possible. If you want to talk about MRIs, I think that acronym is familiar enough. Otherwise, avoid them. Any other insider jargon also to be avoided. Pretend we're all your family members sitting around the dinner table and you're trying to help them understand. Now let me introduce our panelists. On the yes side, we have two speakers. Jessica Adamson is Director of Governmental Relations for Providence Health and Services. Felisa Higgins is a member of the Oregon Health Policy Board and political director of Service Employees International Union, Local 49. On the no side, we have State Representative Julie Parrish at the end here, a Republican from West Lynn. She is a chief sponsor of the petition drive to refer uh, parts of the bill to the ballot that became Measure 101. She chose to appear alone after another chief sponsor, State Representative Cedric Hayden, 
uh, was in, went, unable to attend because of a scheduling conflict. She will receive an equal amount of time to the yes speakers. To open our discussion, each side will have two minutes for a statement. Once the opening statements have concluded, we'll move on to questions. Each question will be directed to a particular side, and that side will have 90 seconds to respond to the question, after which the other side will have 60 seconds to offer a rebuttal. And this is important. Please refrain from clapping or cheering during the debate. It's important for our broadcast audience to hear both sides without distractions or interruptions. So we'll begin with opening statements, and Representative Parrish will go first. Well, thank you for having me today. I'm Julie Parrish. I'm the state representative from House District 37, which is Westland and Tualatin. Uh, I was actually a freshman lawmaker the year that we passed the Affordable Care Act, and we had two big jobs to do. Uh, what were we going to do about the insurance market, which the legislature chose a path to go down, cover Oregon, which we saw, saw where that went to, and then um, what we're going to do about the Medicaid side of the Medicaid expansion. Uh, the legislature chose to create coordinated care organizations, of which I supported. Representative Esquivel, who's one of the chief petitioners, supported that as well. And Dr. Cedric Hayden, who's a Medicaid practitioner who apologizes. He's actually in the OR doing surgery with Medicaid patients this morning. He's a, uh, an oral health surgeon. Um, we said that we wanted to look at have voters look at Measure 101 largely because we believe the taxes, $330 million of a $13.69 billion budget, $330 million of a $13.69 billion budget, we believe those portions of the bill were unfair, they were unsustainable, and they were inequitable. They're unfair because of who the taxes tax. Individuals who are struggling with rent sized insurance payments to have insurance coverage for themselves, some of whom do not get tax credits in the ACA. College students, small businesses, nonprofits, while we left Oregon's largest corporations, unions, and insurance companies free from having to pay and shoulder any of the obligation for the Medicaid population. They're unsustainable because two years from now, the taxes sunset and Oregon's share of Medicaid will actually be greater and we will need to raise more taxes or find more money to keep the 350,000 lives that myself and Dr. Hayden are actually committed to covering. Lastly, understand 350,000 people on January 24th do not lose their health care if voters vote no. Uh, the amount of money that we're repealing is nowhere near what it costs to cover 350,000 Oregonians. So I look forward to a debate today. I thank you all for being here and being engaged. Um, and thank you. My two minutes is up. <laughs> it goes quick. All right, to the yes side. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Providence Health and Services is in strong support of Measure 101, together with 165 other organizations across the state nurses, doctors, AARP, teachers, labor, a wide range of folks, and we're all supportive um, of this measure because of the people that we serve. Because that we know that access to health care that brings people into primary care lowers costs and improves outcomes, and that's why we're here today. Providence Health and Services is an insurer and a health care provider. We're Oregon's largest health system which means that these are taxes that we're going to pay. They're taxes that we agreed to pay in a process that led us through the legislative session that reached a bipartisan, broad, supported compromise through the legislative process. And we stand here in support of Measure 101 today because we believe that this is the only way to guarantee that Oregonians will have access to health insurance. This is the only way to guarantee the Medicaid recipients will be able to see their doctor. Today, 95% of Oregonians have access to health care coverage. And we do not want to go back to the days in 2004 when we rationed health care in this state. We are not willing to do that as a state. For us as Providence, it is central and core to our mission to serve the poor and vulnerable. And so we are here today to stand up and say it is important to vote yes on Measure 101, because anything else is a gamble. It puts it back at the legislature. There is no plan B for how we would fund Medicaid, and it puts people's lives at risk, and that's not something we're willing to do. So we look forward to the debate today and to talk more about why yes on Measure 101 is the only sure solution to health care for all Oregonians. Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, I think right at the top it's important to put the stakes in perspective. Um, and I'm going to start with Representative Parrish, and then we'll get a response from the other side. What do you think will happen if voters reject Measure 101? Thank you. Well, I believe we come back as lawmakers. We have the ability to come back and, and look at other legislation. Um, there was other legislation. To say that there was no Plan B uh, simply wasn't true. There were bills that were crafted that were never given an opportunity to have a fair hearing. There were bills that uh, never got a chance to be scored by the legislature, and largely because the bill that got passed was passed in a back room with special interest crafting that bill um, and, you know, with not a lot of debate. I mean, up until the very last minute, I went to one of my Democratic lawmakers on the Senate side and I said, did you know that this will take $25 million out of the K-12 budget because Oregon school systems purchase their health care in the large group market? And the answer I got from a, a Democratic senator I actually really respect um, was, well, it's too late. And, you know, we looked at that and we said, no, it's really not too late. I, as a, in my House district, this tax will be a $1.5 million hit right out of my K-12 classrooms. I've gone and talked to all the CFOs of the schools. Beaverton Public Schools said it will be a $540,000 tax hit. The fact is, is that had the legislature used the, um, uh, sequestered the first tier economic revenue that having an expanded Medicaid population actually brings in, had we said be the, the taxes that you all pay as healthcare workers, and we said let's bank and earmark that and fund Medicaid first before we fund other special interest projects, we would have had the money for, for Medicaid. We actually have more revenue right now in Oregon's general fund than we have ever had in the history of the state. Go ahead. Great. I want to just be clear about what Measure 101 is about, because on January 23rd, you're going to have to make a decision. And so if Measure 101 fails, that means the Oregonians could lose health care coverage. It means that a million people's health care is at risk. 400,000 of those people are children. It means the legislature will come back together and begin systematically cutting benefits that people rely on, mental health benefits, prescription drug benefits, or they will begin cutting people off the Oregon Health Plan. I was one of those kids on Medicaid. I went to college, I didn't have health insurance, I didn't have health insurance in high school. It was my only way that I saw a dentist for the first time when I was 18 years old because of Medicaid. That's who we're talking about. If Measure 101 fails, we will head into a legislative session like we did in 2003, and those cuts will begin to happen. Okay, I want to start with supporters that this time, and I think, uh, Felicia, you uh, helped give a context to this. But, but I want to know, I mean, we, we do have uh, a, a much larger budget besides, obviously, just the Medicaid budget. It's about $20 uh, billion over the biennium, I believe. I mean, our, our, there are certainly other potential parts in the budget. When you, you seem to be implying by that statement that, that you think that all the, 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 the cuts will come out of the health care budget to, to fill that hole. Is that indeed the case, or is it possible they can find other areas in the budget? Jeff, I'm a school board member in addition to everything else I do, and I can tell you, as a school board member, we worry all the time about whether or not additional cuts would come out of our schools. In my school district ran some numbers. If the state were to look um, across the state budget, for filling this hole, what that would be. And that would be between three hundred and twenty-eight and four hundred and ninety-six thousand dollars that could come out of the Sherwood School District budget if this measure fails. Now I can tell you that um, I've been around Oregon legislature a long time and uh, legislators that I know don't like to touch the K-12 budget um, to try and rebalance things. They don't like to touch the corrections budget and they really would not want to cut the Medicaid budget. But those are the three big budgets of the state. And $300 million in the middle of a legislative session, in midway through the biennium, is like trying to find $600 million at the beginning of the biennium. It is very, very difficult. This isn't money that's just sitting around in some rainy day fund or that might come in um, through a revenue forecast. That's not how this works. I've been around long enough to know and to tell you, and you have too, that these are not simple choices. These are not easy decisions. 
either we are going to be cutting people off of health care or we're going to be making some really terrible, terrible decisions in other budgets. None of them are good outcomes. The only sure way is Measure 101. Representative Parrish. Thank you. Well, um, I, I hate to be a cynic, but we've sort of heard that doom and gloom before. I mean, voters just said no to Measure 97, and we heard the drumbeat of we don't have enough money for taxes, and yet the legislature somehow managed to find oh, hundreds of millions of dollars for new programmatic spending that weren't in the budget before. We passed $55 million for Cover All Kids. Whether you like that policy or not, it's $55 million of new state funding. We found $10 million, of which Providence is a beneficiary for House Bill 3391, which was a universal abortion mandate coverage bill. Again, whether you like the policy or not, it was $10 million of new spending. And SEIU got $100 million of new raises. So when we walked into a budget hole at the beginning and then suddenly found $165 million for three new spending items, I would argue, again, that if we were serious about funding Medicaid and public schools, we would do them first and not at the end of June after other money has been appropriated to special interests. Okay. Well, I think this gives me an opening to the next question uh, for Representative Parrish. So give me your specific plan for how you would raise the uh, as much as $320 million needed to replace the proposed taxes that you want voters to reject? Thank you, Jeff. That's a great question. So um, there's going to be some dispute about this. Uh, since the legislature has ended uh, its session, we've seen our caseloads in Oregon go down by 63,000. That is $100 million of state resources that Dr. Hayden and I believe were over budgeted in House Bill 2391. If we did not do a 0.7% true tax on hospitals, which we have a legal opinion that says can be used for other things besides Medicaid, then we could actually take the 0.7% and use it as the closed loop assessment and keep money in Medicaid. We believe that there's $200 million of headroom in that process. If you don't know what that is, that is where Oregon borrows money from hospitals. We take $100 from your local hospital. We run it up to Uncle Sam. We match it three to one to Medicaid. We bring it back down. We give $100 to the hospitals. They get a bonus. They get a 3% sweetener that pays for lobbyists to come out and talk to you today. Uh, they get that 3% sweetener, and then the rest goes into Medicaid. We could have actually done that to the 0.7% and kept that closed loop assessment, but we didn't. We made that a true tax. You've read the stories where Medicaid organizations owe back the state $64 million. There was $20 million that uh, Pat Allen said on November 11th or November 17th that was um, unallocated in the Ways and Means process because they didn't even know it was in OHA's checkbook. There's $14 million of accounts receivable. There's $47 million in an additional um, revenue forecast, and that was before we had offered up a tobacco tax and a brand new vaping tax where we would dedicate those dollars to mental health. Uh, Dr. Hayden and I are still committed to that. That was what part of what was in the alternative plan. Okay, thank you. From the yes side. Yes, we're happy to talk about those numbers. So um, let's start with the cigarette tax. Providence has long supported um, increases in the tobacco tax. Um, however, uh, the last time um, that the cigarette tax was increased to pay for children's health care, it got put on the ballot, $13 million of out-of-state money came in, and it went down. And that was for children's health care. So um, if there were votes in both chambers to do that, um, that would be news to us because there certainly weren't during the legislative session. So why they would appear now would be surprising to us. Let's talk a little bit about the hospital taxes. Providence has eight hospitals across the state. Five of them are the large hospitals that will be subject to the new assessment. If there was $200 million in headroom, which there is not, we would not be here. And in fact, doing what Representative Parrish wants to do would blow another $30 million hole in the budget. So that's not a good idea. Let's not do that. Um, they, these numbers are just not true. And they're not real, and you can't count on them. We couldn't count on them during the legislative session. We can't count on them now. Measure 101 is the only option. Okay, thank you. And uh, now it's time for a reminder. I'm Jeff Mapes. We're debating Measure 101 with Julie Parrish, the Republican State Representative for House District 37, Jessica Adamson, Director of Governmental Relations at Oregon Providence Health and Services, and Felicia Higgins, a member of the Oregon Health Policy Board and Political Director of SEIU Local 49. Those of you following the debate on Facebook or Twitter 
can post your questions and we'll ask some during the Q&A. If you are here at the Sentinel Hotel, please write your question on a note card and raise your hand so that city staff can collect it. Okay, so let's go back, uh, I believe it's the yes side to, to go first this time. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the potential impact on school districts. Uh, Representative Parrish is talking about it, a $25 million uh, addition in costs that they will have to pay as a result of these taxes. Is that accurate, and is this indeed a difficult burden for schools to bear? So I, Jeff, thanks for asking the question again. I, I think uh, Jessica has actually answered this as a school board member, but I also want to remind people that there's no way that Oregon's teachers would come out and support Measure 101 if they thought that teachers were going to be laid off. There's no way that the coalition of school administrators would have endorsed Measure 101 if they thought that there were going to be deep cuts to education by supporting this measure. There is no way the Oregon School Boards Association would have supported Measure 101. Children's First for Oregon, um, you know, Stand for Children. I could go on and on, head start, of all of the organizations who are out here who have supported children, who have supported Medicaid, who are supporting Measure 101 because they know that without Measure 101, we will see deep and drastic cuts in the state budget. And those, bu the, those cuts could come out of schools, or we can cut people off the health plan. Jessica talked about earlier, there is no magic money. I feel like if there were magic money in the budget, we would have found it by now. That the reality is we have to deal with the budget that we have and the income we have, and that the people who are paying this assessment have agreed. We have Providence Health Systems here, health systems in the audience out supporting this measure, Kaiser Permanente supporting the measure, uh, Samaritan Health Systems, there's not a single health system or insurer who's come out in opposition to this measure, and there's not one child or children's advocate who's come out in opposition to this measure. Representative Parrish. Thank you. Well, I find it interesting that the hospitals and the insurance companies who were just a, uh, most of them were a no on 97, are now begging you and spending $2.5 million begging you to tax them. Where does that money come from? Providence has said that this will cost them $28 million. It's on net patient revenues. Who's going to pay that? Is Providence actually going to pay that out of the goodness of their heart? And on the insurance side that Providence does, Providence has in Section 8, which is part of the Measure 101 repeal, the legal authority to pass that on to rate payers as part of the, as part of the assessment. It is effectively a sales tax on health care you know, authorized by my colleagues in the legislature. Please read the bill. It says very clearly, it even kind of says it in the ballot title that was kind of rigged by my, my colleagues, uh, that it says that 1.5% can be passed on to ratepayers. Providence isn't going to pay this. You will pay it in the form of higher insurance costs and higher health care costs. Okay, thank, I, I think it's important here. I'd like to get sort of more clarity from supporters on why it was structured as it is. I know this is complicated. In the past, we've largely relied on uh, hospital provider taxes, which I think in a way are simpler because the hospitals get a much bigger match back. I think it's from the federal government for that. And so in that sense, it's clear to them why they're supporting this. Th this is a little more complicated, maybe harder for people to understand. Explain why it was structured as it was. Sure, we spent six months working on this structure, and um, let me start by saying that um, you know these are compromises, and what we believe the voters um, ask legislators to do, and what we as organizations feel compelled to do when we are working together to solve big problems, is to work together to find common ground, and sometimes that means we're making hard choices. Measure 101 um, utilizes provider taxes, which have been used in this state since 2004. And they are a tried and true way used in 49 states across this country to raise money and draw down federal match. Um, the provider assessment on hospitals is now maximized uh, for large hospitals at 7% or 6%, which is a federal cap. Can't do any more than that. And included in that, is a 0.7% um, non-refundable assessment. And that's something that hospitals agreed to do to close the budget gap of $30 million to make it refundable 
would cost the state $30 million. So that, that was a decision that hospitals were willing to do. On the insurer assessment side, this is a method we've used before. In 2009, when um, the, the effort to use tobacco taxes went down, we agreed, and the Oregonian actually praised insurers for agreeing to use a provider assessment on insurers. It's the same mechanism we used from 2009 to 2013. We brought it back to close the gap here. Okay. Um, I want to ask Representative Parrish uh, at another Measure 101 debate last month. She said, you know, sometimes the way to heal that broken bone that didn't heal right is to break it and reset it, and that's kind of what Measure 101 is about. What did you mean by that? Yeah, thank you, because I think that that quote's been taken um, significantly out of context. It was in the course of an hour-long debate where we had talked about a $300 million failure on Cover Oregon. And the race after John Kitzhaber was sort of exiled from being our governor by his own party, where uh, we raced to abolish Cover Oregon. And the net result of that was hundreds of millions of dollars more on failed software, which led to hundreds of millions of dollars of overpayments in the Medicaid system, which has led to lawsuits and golden parachutes and roughly a billion dollars wasted of our health care dollars since the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Our health care system is broken. Look around here in Portland. Look at what's happening with family care. Look at hap the fact is, is that the only risk to health care right now is one of the state's oldest and largest Medicaid providers being shut down and the legislature doing nothing about it. And providers who are looking at having to not be able to serve their patients. I have providers calling me on Christmas Day who are worried about family care's closure and the state is doing nothing. We could have come into a special session to fix that family care issue but we didn't. We did it for big corporations in a December one-day special session to give them a 30-year tax surety and business surety, but we won't do that as we're firing 322 health care providers at Family Care, as providers who don't get paid enough in reimbursements from health share are saying we might not be able to take patients. Just because you have insurance coverage doesn't mean you have access. That's the real threat right now happening in health care. It's happening right here in your community, and the legislature is silent on it. Lisa? Th thank you for the question, Jeff. So I was actually sitting right next to Representative Parrish when she made this statement. I think we've heard her frustrations with the overall health care system. Many of us actually have experienced these frustrations, and I've been working for my entire career as a health care advocate to do make sure healthcare is affordable, make sure healthcare is accessible, make sure that people get the care they need in the right place with the right provider. I've sat on the Oregon Health Policy Board, the Oregon Health Share Board, and when we look at the coalition who's supporting Measure 101, these are the same advocates. This is the same coalition that comes together to support children's healthcare when it comes to the CHIP program nationally. These are the same advocates who go down to the legislative session year after year after year to fight for things, frankly, like single payer. This is the same coalition who fights for mental health and advocates for the homelessness, homeless folks who are on our streets that Representative Parrish is talking about in every community in our state. That's why we should support Measure 101. We know we are the real Medicaid advocates. Okay, this is directed to the supporters. Uh, what do you say to consumers who are already worried about affording their health care? How big of a burden are you asking them to bear with these taxes? For individuals who are buying their insurance on the individual market, uh, the most um, fragile market in this state, um, we know Providence is the only statewide carrier on the individual market. Um, this measure is essential for them. This measure is about affordability for them because this measure um, includes the reinsurance program and the funding for the reinsurance program that this year, starting five days ago, means that insurance premiums are $300 a year on average, less than they would be otherwise, except for that reinsurance program. That's net of any assessment, Jeff. That, that means that people are paying $25 a month less than they would be otherwise because of this measure, because of what happened in House Bill 2391, because of the hard work that all of these groups came together to do and said, how do we solve 
the funding problem in this state? How do we stabilize the individual market? If we want to make health care affordable for individuals, we have to make sure that those in the most vulnerable market in this state, the individual market, can continue to afford their insurance. And the reinsurance program is essential to that. That's what Measure 101 also does. That's why we need to vote yes in January. Representative Parrish. Thank you. Well, 1.2 million lives, the lives of 1.2 million people who have insurance that are be subject to this tax, do not qualify for the reinsurance program. Only the people in the individual market. That means your smallest of your small employers do not get that benefit. They'll be subsidizing that benefit while large corporations and unions and insurance companies won't. They'll be subsidizing it. So the farmer in Eugene, he'll be paying the 1.5% tax. Read his voters' pamphlet statement. He got a 73% rate increase last year. DCBS said the average rate increase in Oregon was 25%. So a reinsurance program on top of this year's as high as 21% rate increases, double-digit rate increases year over year over year because the exchange never worked the way it was supposed to. We never got enough lives into it to make it make sense or break even. It was supposed to have 285,000 lives by December 15. And we had a plan for that. The legislature had a plan for that, to put school districts into the exchange. We passed that law and came back and undid that law the very next year. The exchange isn't working, and an expensive reinsurance program subsidized by other people who are paying that tax, while half of the state doesn't bear that burden, that's the part that makes this unfair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, directed to Representative Parrish, uh, in the context of the more than $25 billion a year that's spent on health care in this state, these taxes are only a blip, uh, and they are going to bring in a lot more federal money. We've talked a lot about that, the three times match. Why take a risk with people's health coverage for a, after we've done a legislative compromise that did, after all, get the support of the Republican leader of the Senate? Well, let's talk about that vote from the Republican leader of the Senate, the same one who's no longer a senator and now has a new job that the governor appointed him to. Um, he voted yes for the tax, but the media did not pick up on the fact that he voted no on the OHA budget. So while he made a really good show of saying that we need to pay these, you know, we need to fund Medicaid, he didn't actually carry that commitment all the way through. So uh, one of the people who voted yes in the House, Representative Esquivel, after he realized that we were going to spend more money than we had budgeted uh, for health care, for things that were uh, passed right at the very last week of the legislative session, he came back on as a petitioner. He decided that the 90,000 Oregonians who signed this petition who don't have a lobbyist deserve to have a say on this. And so who cares about their health care? If you've got people like constituents I represent who are paying $2,000 a month for their premiums, who is arguing for them? They don't write hundreds of thousands of dollars of checks. The hospital associations have written to try to get people to convince people to vote yes on a tax that they'll pick up the tab, I'm sure, themselves. No way. Who represents those people? I have been all over this state. I have put 10,000 miles on my car in the last six months talking to people all over this state. And guess what? It wasn't, this is not an RRD issue. We couldn't have made it to the ballot without the thousands of Democrats in Oregon who signed the petition. The thousands of independents and non-affiliated voters who signed the petition because this is a checkbook issue, not a party issue. All right, the yes side. I hear Representative Parrish's frustration with the legislature, and I understand that Sal Escaval is on the opposition side. Unfortunately, the legislature is not kindergarten, and there are no take backies. This is actually about a compromise that happened during the session that they now refer to the ballot. And so we're going to have a conversation. We should stick to the conversation about what this is about. This is about funding our Medicaid program. So it may be a small blip in the budget, but for the kids around this state who rely on the Medicaid program, it is a big deal for them. It's a big deal for the Lux who live in Damascus, who, you know, Matt got cancer. He lost his job after he got cancer and needed the Oregon Health Plan. Without the Oregon Health Plan, he would be bankrupt. His family would be living on the streets, and they know that. This is who this is about. That's what Measure 1 is about, and that's why we need people to come out January 23rd, mail in your ballots, you got them in right now, vote yes on Measure 101. All right, uh, this one's directed to the supporters. 
Uh, if Measure 101 is approved, these taxes will only be levied for two years. What should come next? Um, so, yeah, they are a short assessment, but I feel like what we have seen with this coalition is it's incredible that when people really care about Medicaid, we can come together, we can find a solution in the legislature, we can keep our 95% health and coverage, we can make sure every kid in this state has health care. And so I trust that the same coalition that's out there fighting, the 165 Oregonians, 165,000 or 165 organizations, hundreds of thousands of Oregonians, who are gonna vote yes on Measure 101 can come together in the next session and come up with a longer term solution around this. I trust that Jessica Adamson and I are gonna be working very closely on that solution moving forward. I trust that the legislature who is the legislators who are supporting this are gonna be working very closely on that solution. And I feel really strongly that when Measure 101 passes and we reaffirm once again that Oregonians believe every person in our state should have health care that the legislature will come together that will add to this package, including a, more solutions to continue to fund access to affordable health care in our state. Uh, Representative Parrish. Thank you. Um, well, I can tell you what I think happens next uh, year, when, 2019, when we come back. The hospitals have capped out on the points, uh, the 6% that the federal government allows them to use through that assessment. And when our copay for Medicaid goes from 6% to 10%, and we need hundreds of millions more dollars to keep 350,000 lives covered, the logical choice is, one, expand that tax to the smallest hospitals in the state. We have a legal opinion from legislative council from last month that says the A and B, our smallest hospitals, can be expanded into that true tax without a three-fifths vote. We also believe that we'll come back and say, well, we need to go up to you know 3% or 5% or 6% on insurance of, again, premiums of payers who actually are struggling to pay for their own health care. We'll go back and tap that again because understand, we've had a long time to look at this. Some of us have been trying to look at it for since the very beginning. I went back and found an article from 2011 where I'm quoted talking about transparency in health care and looking at what's coming in the future. And here we are, and the legislature didn't plan, and the crisis is now here of our own making for failure to do the right thing from the beginning. Okay. Um, uh, Representative Parrish gets to start this time. Uh, the recent audit from the Secretary of State's office raised several problems with the Oregon Health Authority and how it administers Medicaid in this state. Does that have any relevance to this discussion of Measure 101? Well, I think it does. I think we overfunded Medicaid in House Bill 2391. Um, we saw where there were thousands of people who were um, deemed ineligible, either residency or income ineligible. Some people were making payments to CCOs for folks who didn't even live in the state. So when we went away, or largely went away for fee-for-service, if Sally signs up for Medicaid on January 1st, even if she moves to another state, say three months later, and we don't know she's moved, we keep paying that CCO. In fact, it was so much money flowing out to particularly some of the for-profit Medicaid organizations that you had Trillium Services in Eugene accumulated so much of our Medicaid dollars on their books that they sold out to an out-of-state corporation for $130 million. Now, Mitch Greenlick has tried to bring legislation to make our CCOs go nonprofit. That died. Mitch Greenlick tried to bring legislation to say that CCOs and organizations like them that get our tax dollars should not be able to use those tax dollars in politics. That died, his own party killed it. So there are reforms that certainly need to happen. But then, you know, Pat Allen came out and the OHA came out and said, here's another $112 million of money we screwed up on top of what the audit discussed. And in that, and, and you saw the articles that came out and the governor sort of got shamed into whether or not we're gonna try to claw back $64 million from CCOs because we improperly coded 41,000 Oregonians into the Medicaid expansion population who should have been in Medicare, and that cost us money, and we still don't have that $64 million back. It's all tied together, Jeff. It's a big part of the conversation. Okay, the supporters? Sure. I think that there was a lot of information um, that Representative Parrish put out, and I think some of it was inaccurate. So let's just start with the Secretary of State's audit. Um, which pointed out some good accounting mechanisms that the Oregon Health Authority actually has implemented and will continue to move going forward. It also pointed out that Oregon's error rate 
is half that of some other states and one of the lowest error rates in the nation when it comes to continuing to fund people on the Oregon Health Plan who have moved. I also think, I wanna just boil this down to a fundamental issue that Representative Parrish pointed out. In some cases, Medicare should have paid when Medicaid should have paid. But all of those people who got health care needed health care. They were all low-income people. So if you're 64 years old and you're making $10,000 a year and you go to the hospital and you need health care, Medicaid ended up paying for you. And sure, we should bill Medicare for that when you turn 65. But either way, you deserve health care. Okay, thank you very much. For our broadcast audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Jeff Mapes, and we're debating Measure 101 with Julie Parrish, Republican State Representative for House District 37, Jessica Adamson, Director of Governmental Relations at Oregon Providence and Health Services, and Felicia Hagens, a member of the Oregon Health Policy Board and Political Director of SEIU Local 49. Okay, we're gonna to go to audience questions now. Each side will have 45 seconds to respond to each question so that we can get as many questions uh, as possible. So the first question is uh, directed to the yes side, and it says, you talked about 350,000 Oregonians losing health care coverage if Measure 101 doesn't pass. Where does that figure come from, and why are they most at risk? Yeah, thank you, Jeff. The, those are the um, folks that joined the Oregon Health Plan because of the expansion of Medicaid passed in the Affordable Care Act. They're called generally the ACA expansion population. And those are folks between 100 and 138 percent of the federal poverty level. These are the working poor. These are folks working part time with kids that are just doing the best they can to hold everything together. And these folks, um, are most at risk because it's an all or nothing deal with the expansion population. Either you cover everyone or none of them. And that's why if we cannot find a solution here, we're gonna have to be pulling the cord on a lot of folks and that is just unacceptable to us. Representative Parrish. Thank you. So when we did expand Medicaid, we decided that we would follow the federal poverty limit of 138%. One of the bigger threats to people losing health care was the legislature's decision to increase the minimum wage. In Portland, if I'm married and I, and I have a brand new $11.25 wage, two peop, a two-person family no longer qualifies for Medicaid under that wage the next time they are determined eligible or ineligible in this point. So probably should look at some of the other factors that are in, uh, in solving the, or sorry, look at some of the other factors that are um, causing the caseloads to decline. But understand, 350,000 Oregonians is $3.6 billion. That's how much we would need to cover that. The measure is $330 million, and even the voters' pamphlet says that, uh, that we are not uh, yet federally qualified for the match on those dollars. Okay, next question directed to Representative Parrish. Uh, you've been criticized for your lack of support uh, among, you know, the wide variety of groups out there, uh, civic, business, health groups. Does this indicate anything about the lack of seriousness of your effort? Well, you know what, I don't mind being criticized by special interests who benefit from this tax. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, I told voters in my community that uh, I would be willing to stand up to people, even if they made a contribution to my campaign, I'd be willing to stand up to those folks. The fact is, is you're not debating lawmakers. This is not a debate between people who voted for it. I'm sitting here debating the special interests that benefit from these dollars, and I think that that's a problem. When you have $2.8 million that for-profit Medicaid organizations put into the political action committees of yes votes, do you really think Oregonians are going to get a fair package? I mean, the 90,000 people who signed this petition, they don't have a lobbyist. Somebody has to stand up for them, and I think Dr. Hayden and I are not uh, afraid to do that. The yes side? Great. I think that this is a clear difference between the two campaigns. We talk about our huge coalition who's come together, um, who are the real Medicaid advocates who are supporting Measure 101. Representative Parrish did have a chance to have this debate with lawmakers. She had that in the legislature. They did not agree with her. They agreed with the 165 Oregon organizations, and I hope that thousands, hundreds of thousands of Oregonians who are going to vote yes for Measure 101. When we talk about special interests, and Representative Parrish talks about special interests, 
Absolutely. The people who serve Medicaid and who are on Medicaid have a special interest in making sure Measure 101 passes. The kids organizations who are on Medicaid and the parents who have their children on Medicaid have a special interest. And I hope the rest of Oregonian understands we have a special interest to vote yes for Measure 101. Uh, another question uh, directed to the yes side this time. Can you say more about how Measure 101 particularly affects children and people with disabilities? So children are among the, the groups of individuals who qualify for Medicaid first and foremost. And children are at getting them care early, getting them into primary care, making sure that they're not getting care in an emergency department. Medicaid, when it was first started, really was focused on pregnancy and children and making sure that they had access to care. Because what we know is not only are children the most vulnerable, and if we can start them out healthy and well, um, they are less likely to live a life in poverty. Um, that is why Medicaid was first started, was to really care for those, and for those with disabilities, and for seniors. And that is what Oregon's Medicaid program continues to do, and why Measure 101 is so necessary. Gosh, 45 seconds is short. <laughs> <It's> short. <laughs> All right, Representative Parrish. Can you just repeat that question? I'm sorry. Uh, and you were shuffling through them. So. Yeah, I've been shuffling through for the uh, whole ones. I believe it was basically... Why are kids and seniors yes, and just people with kids and disabled people vulnerable? particularly at risk? Well, so we don't think they're at risk, and ultimately, uh, one of the things that you should know is Section 3 of House Bill 2391 included a $12 million transfer out of the general fund to, for a PEB tax. This is PEB is the Public Employee Benefit Board. Uh, it's not a real tax. Public employees aren't paying it. It came out of the general fund. At the same time, we cut $12 million out of the DHS budget for people with disabilities. What's one of the reasons why Section 3 is in the repeal? Because we don't think transferring money out of our general fund to insurance companies and, and cut the DHS budget by $12 million at the same time was good public policy. Okay, and I think this sort of builds on this, and uh, this questioner says that they fear if Measure 101 fails, uh, that, that uh, hundreds of thousands of Oregonians potentially could lose their health care and be forced to emergency rooms for their care. Uh, what will this do to premiums for those who still have insurance? And whether you know it's a large number of people who lose health care or not, is there potentially a negative impact on premiums uh, if, if there's more of a cost shift? Well, again, I think that starts with the premise that you accept the yes votes um, argument that $330 million covers 350,000 people for, with health care. It doesn't. That math doesn't add up. The average CCO payment in this state is $430 per person per month. So when you multiply that out for the biennium across 350,000 Oregonians, we are talking about $3.61 billion. Even if you were to take, say that every dime of this is matchable, and we are waiting on a legal opinion still from the federal government, we think that one piece of this is not matchable, uh, it still doesn't, the re referendum still does not equal $3.61 billion. So we just dispute the fact that there is this, um, you know, doom and gloom scenario where the legislature will do nothing after voters vote no, that they'll do nothing and they'll just, we won't be able to come back and talk about that tobacco tax, which we did pass one in 2013, if you recall. Go ahead, Liz. Yeah, yeah. That's in 2013 was not on the ballot. Uh, so, Representative Parrish, um, I believe the question was what happens when people lose their insurance? Do premiums go up when people seek care in the emergency room? So I'm happy to answer that question. The answer to that is yes. Yes, that is what happens when people get care in the most expensive setting in the emergency room because they do not have access to primary care because they don't have an insurance card. Costs go up. There is no plan B. We were here in 2004 when a measure at the ballot failed to provide in, um, revenue to cover um, costs of state government. We went back in in 2004 and we started a lottery for access to the Oregon Health Plan. We cannot go back there. Health insurance costs went up for everyone when that happened. We're not willing to do that. Please vote yes on Measure 101. 
Okay, uh, this is directed to the supporters. Uh, some of the criticism of it is that, uh, from, from opponents, is that the insurance tax is unfair because it doesn't affect many large corporations that self-insure. And the question is, should you have tried to find a method that would require them to pay their fair share? So Jeff, there are federal requirements around provider assessments. They're not decisions that, that we make, they're decisions that the federal government makes. The federal government has restrictions on these kinds of what are called ERISA, um, which is a very um, long uh, acronym for essentially self-insured and um, employer funds as well as Medicare and TRICARE. There are lots of things that they say you can't do that. And so we have to live within the law. To try and to tax self-insured plans would have sent us to court. We don't think that's responsible. We think that the most responsible thing to do is to use a tried and true method, one we used from 2009 to 2013 to fund healthy kids, again, to fill the Medicaid gap. That's what we did and what we thought was the most responsible option. Okay. Uh we go to, I'm sorry, you Thank get you. a response. Thank you, I do get yes. to respond. Uh, I just heard my uh, opposition say that taxing the insurance of corporations is not responsible, which infers that taxing the insurance of small business is. Uh, the United States Sixth Circuit Court actually ruled that taxing, taxing self-insured plans for the purpose of funding Medicaid, they said it was legal. And in fact, the United Supreme, States Supreme Court in, uh, in last year refused to certify that case. And our own legislative council has said that that is very strong grounds for us being able to, in the Ninth Circuit, pass a tax, if that was the choice, on large corporations, unions, and anybody who self-insures. But we didn't do that. And so, yes, could a large corporation or an insurance company come sue us if we tried to tax their self-insured plan? You bet. I could sue us for any law. Any of us could sue us for any law that gets passed. We can challenge that in court. However, Another circuit court's already <laughs> ruled, and so we do believe that that is a legal pathway. All right, last question, um, and I guess, of course, we have to talk about the national uh, political situation. How does the federal tax reform bill impact our state budget on Medicare and health care? You want to start with me? Yes, sorry. Well, uh, our legislative fiscal is still doing some analysis, but whether or not you like the tax cuts that were passed in Congress, uh, they will actually generate more revenue in our state general fund. An early analysis showed $300 million because uh, our federal, uh, where we start Oregon's tax return is based on your federal adjusted gross income. And so uh, they are doing a final analysis. That number will probably be cut, bring down uh, how much revenue comes into the, our state general fund. I'm sure my colleagues aren't really interested in giving that money back to Oregon taxpayers when they have to pay more in their state taxes as a result of those tax cuts. But uh, Chris Allenack, the economist, said that there's definitely a positive revenue impact in the general fund because of the congressional tax cut. Okay, thank you. To the yes side. Well, I think what we know about federal tax reform um, in Oregon's law is that we have this thing called a kicker. And it is an uncertain um, environment. So if we do end up bringing in significant new resources that weren't anticipated, will result in a kicker, not additional revenue to somehow address any, any budget hole. What I would say is that the only sure thing, given all of the federal uncertainty over Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, um, all of the activity that many of us in the Yes for 101 coalition are lobbying um, our members of Congress to try and resolve, that that uncertainty cannot extend to home. We have got to here in Oregon right now with the vote that we have in just, just a few days, vote yes on 101 so that we can guarantee health care here for Oregonians under the system we have today. Okay, thank you for the questions. We'll now allow each side one minute for their closing comments. The yes side gets to go first. Well, thank you, City Club, for having me here today. I'm a member of the City Club, and I've always been proud to be a member of the City Club. And the reports that you have put out in your research committees on health care are critical to our community. Measure 101 is the only guaranteed plan to protect health care coverage for Oregon's most vulnerable. That's why there are 160 coalition partners who are supporting Measure 101 and who know that nurses, the Oregon Medical Association, AARP, and others know that this is the right thing to do. 
It was a bipartisan solution that protects health care for children. And frankly, family like the Lux, who live in Damascus, who I talked about earlier. Measure 101 is the right way to move forward. Anything else is a gamble. We've heard this before. We'll just repeal it. Just repeal it, and we'll do something else. That's not the answer. That's not the Oregon answer. That's not Oregonians' values. Our value is that every person in our state should have health care. We're at 95%. Vote yes on Measure 101. Volunteer, donate. Let's not go backwards. And for the no side. Thank you. Well, Measure 101 for us is actually a, a fairly simple question. It's not about whether voters are voting whether we should fund Medicaid. Myself and Dr. Hayden and Representative Esquivel, we've all taken those votes. My very first bill was a bill to expand Medicaid to the short-term prison population, which may have saved my sister's life after she overdosed and died coming out of the Coffee Creek Women's Prison. So for me, it's personal. But it's not about whether we should, it's about how. And did the legislature pick a fair, equitable, and sustainable way to fund Medicaid? When you're taxing a small portion of the population, half the population, who cannot and is struggling with their own health insurance, was that the right well to go and dip for this money? We don't believe so. Was leaving out large corporations and unions and insurance companies the right way to do it? We don't think so. And what happens two years from now when all of this sunsets and we need more money for Medicaid? Why did the legislature wait? We knew for this for seven years, and I have colleagues who've sat in silence and done nothing. We are urging Oregonians a no on 101. The Oregonian has endorsed that. The Ben Bulletin has endorsed that. Send us back and let's get it right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think applause now is in order. You were a good audience. We are out of broadcast time for today and we'll have to stop for now. If this program has inspired you to join or contribute to City Club and join our conversation, you can do so at the registration table as you leave the room today. This is Lisa Watson from City Club's Board of Governors. Thank you to our guests and special thanks to Bobby Regan and Sam Metz and the Friday Forum Committee for their hard work. We're adjourned.